All right. So uh, today uh, we're just going to spend a, roughly 30 minutes or so talking about some of the uh, remaining concepts in uh, magnetostatics. So we've talked about the Lorentz force and we talked about the total electromagnetic force, the Hall effect sensors, and magnetic torque. This stuff will definitely be on the final exam. Uh, you can also expect that the current induced magnetic fields will also be on the exam. So you have several homework problems uh, on that. And today we're going to talk about some applications of these magnetic fields. We'll talk about electromagnets and we'll talk about um, some concepts of inductance. Um, not all of these things here. We'll just kind of talk about what the basic inductance of a solenoid coil is and some of the magnetic properties of materials. Okay, so like I said, we're going to keep this fairly short and high level. This is just so you have um, you have an understanding for, um, you know, as you move forward and that you can refer back to this uh, later if you need to. So as I said, if you have any questions about this material after the class is over, you know, in a few months, maybe a year later, feel free to email me anytime. I'm happy to give you further material on um, electromagnets, inductance, and some of the concepts that we did not get to this semester. Uh, so I want to start with, with this. I'm going to start with electromagnets. I think you'll find this kind of interesting. Um, electromagnets are an application of the magnetostatics concepts that we've been talking about. Uh, they were invented in, uh, in the 1820s by William Sturgeon, and uh, they have a wide range of applications. Um, and uh, the basic electromagnet is where you have a coil of wire wrapped around a magnetic core. Uh, typically, it could be iron, it could be some other material with high magnetic permeability. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, you run a current through there. And when you run a current through there, you get a magnetic field that goes through um, uh, that goes through uh, uh, the the length of the core. All right. So just on this uh, on the public chat here, um, can you all think of some uses of uh, electromagnets other than the reluctance motors that are mentioned here? Horseshoes are often used. This type of horseshoe magnet. Let me just mention that real quick. The horseshoe magnet is actually where you have um, a magnetic core or a high permeability core that's in the shape of a horseshoe and there's a small gap between the north and between the two ends of it. There's a small gap here. When you power up the core, and when I mean power up means you have a coil and you run current through the coil, it turns out that the magnetic field gets concentrated within the core. Right? The magnetic field just doesn't go out in, um, in uh, random directions, it actually gets concentrated in the core. Just like um, electric current travels through conductive materials. It does not travel through dielectrics. Similarly, magnetic fields also travel through materials of high magnetic permeability. So you can actually concentrate magnetic fields through using a high magnetic permeability materials. So we're generating the magnetic field here in a certain direction, but that magnetic field continues through that high permeability material. All right, and just like circuits 101, uh, where you think about current traveling through a wire, in a, and, and it goes around in a in a direction like this. Uh, similarly, magnetic fields can also travel through what's called magnetic circuits. And here you can see that there's a gap in the magnetic circuit here, um, and you can think about that as being analogous to a um, an open circuit. Um, Air also has the ability to, um, to transmit magnetic fields, so the magnetic circuit can still go through this air gap. But if you have a high permeability material in between, the magnetic field will be able to move much easier, and uh, you will get a different um, response in your inductive um, coil. All right, but anyway, the, 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 the main concept here is that you can use this type of horseshoe to generate a magnetic field um, or this is the uh, north side and this is the south side and you have your magnetic field going um, going from from north to south here like this and this is type of uh, horseshoe magnet is used in reluctance motors as you saw in one of the previous images and just to recall I will just uh, just quickly go back to that image with where I was talking about reluctance motors one second here all right 
So these were some of the synchronous motors here. And what you saw was there's a, um, a, mag uh, a coil here, a coil here. And this material, the rotor in the middle, actually acts as that, um, as that magnetic core. That this magnetic core lines up with the field like this. And so you complete this magnetic circuit. The magnetic field lines can go through here. This is a low reluctance case. A high reluctance case is when that rotor is not aligned and the magnetic field actually has to go through the air or just a portion of that rotor. All right, so this is the concept of a magnetic circuit being applied to um, a reluctance motor. So, so getting back to the question then, what is, you know, what are other, some other applications of electromagnets that you can think of? Just go ahead and type it into the, um, the chat window there. We'll see if we can come up with maybe just, a, you know, just a couple. Speakers, yeah, you got it. I was actually just uh, working with um, some speakers, some old old set of speakers I have in my apartment the other day. And uh, as I took it apart, I was actually looking through and uh, seeing like how these things are made. It's a, it's a good one. Uh, what else? MRI, absolutely. MRI is magnetics, magnetic resonance imaging. This is where magnetic fields and the interactions of magnetic fields with, uh, with uh, protons in your body can actually be used to perform three-dimensional imaging. You've, if you've seen a beautiful three-dimensional scans of body organs, they're usually done with MRI. That requires a super strong uh, electromagnet. Um, Tamina says that headphones, yep, absolutely. The little speakers that are in your headphones are driven by um, magnetic coils that are sometimes called voice coils. And of course, motors, yep, all good examples. Um, so solenoids are used in, in all of those uh, type applications. So that's a good, um, good example. Uh, I wanna highlight one example that uh, I find very fascinating and I think you may also. Uh, is the magnetic levitation trains. So um, some of you may have heard about this term maglev and uh, these trains are floating on a uh, by being levitated by magnets. That's what's quite amazing about it. Um, so imagine you, you know you have a train that looks you know something like this. I, I can't recall which country. I think this was the one from Shanghai. This is the one from the, the textbook. Yeah, and it says like um, courtesy shanghai.com. So that means that the Shanghai maglev is the one that's shown here. And um, you can see that the train sitting on the on the track like this, and we're not going to get into the, all the details of everything that goes into the track. Um, the main concepts that we want to focus on is on is two things. One is how is the train suspended or levitated in air? And number two is how is it propelled? So I'm Actually, looks like I let, have a little typo in this slide. This next one is not suspension, this is propulsion. So there's two um, aspects of using uh, magnetostatics to levitate and move these trains. The first one is magnet and maglev suspension. So the way that you can think about this is that you have the train sitting on the track here. The train has a uh, south pole here, and there's also another magnet here containing a north pole and a south pole here. So what's interesting about this, think back to our basic concepts. You can say like magnets, they always occur in pairs, right? There has to be a north end and a south end at all times. So it's kind of interesting, kind of clever how they arrange this. You have one magnet sitting on one side of the track that's north-south, another magnet sitting on the other side of the track, which is south-north, so it's oriented in the opposite direction, and in the train car itself, you have a magnet sitting laterally, north-south, this way. So the, the, the way this works, and it's quite clever, is that um, this south pole will re repel this south pole. So there's a force pushing the train away, and the direction of the force is this arrow that you see here. This arrow has a horizontal component, and it also has a vertical component. So the vertical component, it's what's suspending the train up in the air. 
you have something similar going on on the left on the right side you have a north pole uh, magnet here all right so in addition to this repulsive force on the bottom you also have uh, an attractive force on the top so you have the the south pole is attracted to the north pole and you can see that the force of attraction has a horizontal component and a vertical component so all the horizontal components are symmetric in this situation so there's a force going this way and there's a force going the other way but they all cancel out in the lateral direction but in the vertical direction they uh, they add up right the vertical forces between uh, south and north attractive and then repulsive here repulsive here and attractive here all the vertical forces add up and as a result the train is literally floating on air since it's floating on air there's very very little friction no friction of wheels rotating or anything like that so these trains can go extremely fast. Um, there's no friction. So the way that, uh, let me just get to the propulsion part of it. The way that you propel a train is by having um, a, uh, uh, essentially a, um, a magnetic field that alternates between north and south. Okay, so that you can see in this case, if, the, uh, if a car happens to be positioned in the middle like this, and there, there are alternating north and south pole magnets on the tracks. Um, the way that you see here is that you can see that the, the south pole magnet is attracted to the north pole magnet here, and then the north pole is repelled from the north pole magnet here. So there's a lateral force in this direction. There's a lateral force in this direction. Similarly, there's a lateral force on this, on this south pole. So in a, in a sense, it's actually very similar to how they're suspended, except now you also have this lateral force that causes the car to move along the track. Okay, and by um, you imagine that the car has an uh, electromagnet in it, so north and south pole, and then a south and north pole. If the car is um, if the car is alternating the direction of these north and south poles and this north and south pole. Or alternatively, the track is, is changing the direction of north and south poles, then that will actually cause the forces, the lateral forces, to change as this car is moving along the track. So this is what we call a traveling wave. The magnetic field is changing as the train is moving in the lateral direction. So that's what propels the train along. Um, and as I said, if, because the train is suspended in air, there's very little friction. Um, no wheels reduce friction means that the tra tra train can travel at very high speeds. Uh, the world record for um, a, a train, uh, not just a maglev train, but any train, is, is held by uh, Japan's, uh, the country of Japan, who, who pioneered the maglev technology and also the maglev trains. Their record set in 2015 was 375 miles per hour. I, I didn't have the units here, so I should, I should have that. This is MPH. 375 miles per hour. Um, France has perfected uh, train technology, high-speed train technology for many years. They're actually able to get pretty darn fast speeds um, on an experimental train, not a passenger one. Uh, 357 miles per hour just actually using standard technology. So this is actually an exception to the rule, I would say. Um, the, the TGV in France is really an amazingly engineered uh, train system. Uh, 357 miles per hour there. Uh, the Shanghai Maglev, this is um, uh, this speed it, it can be attained. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, tracks of Maglev anywhere in the world can be found in China. And these, these uh, trains travel at, at 250 miles per hour. Um, this is some of the highest speeds, but they, they travel, I think, in the 200 mile per hour range on a regular basis. So they're quite amazing. Uh, really amazing for a country to be able to get, get its citizens back and forth. Uh, Italy has standard trains running at 220 miles per hour, and the U.S., sadly, we are actually way down here. The, our fastest uh, train is uh, 150 miles per hour as of 2015. I don't think that number has improved since 2015. Um, you know, this is my plug for the U.S. Uh, going to more advanced uh, train, uh, high-speed train technologies. So we're, <laughs> um, you know, less than 50% of the fastest trains in the world. 
Uh, so let's talk about inductance, uh, inductance and electromagnets. So we're talking about electromagnets. I wanted to center our discussion in this context. So the concept of inductance fits in because whenever you have a coil like this, we're gonna, um, it creates what's called an inductance. Okay, we're not going to have enough time to go into the details of inductance, but the one concept that I would like to tie it to is that an inductor, you know, you have your, you know, the circuit elements that you are aware of is the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. So uh, uh, it turns out that a coil of wire like this is one way that you can make an inductor. And inductors are central components in electromagnets because inductors create magnetic fields when you run current through them. All right, so inductance is the magnetic analog to capacitance. You've learned that the capacitors can store energy in the form of an electric field. Uh, e equals one half CV squared is what we learned. The capacitors store energy. Inductors store energy in a magnetic field. And as I mentioned, a typical inductor is a solenoid, a coil of wire wrapped around a magnetic material. So the first thing we can do is look at the magnetic field in a solenoid coil. Now this is something you actually have a homework question on. And so the homework question is obviously very similar to this. I wanted to make it a little bit straightforward for you since we're at the end of the term here. Uh, this talks about the magnetic field in a coil and we're deriving it using um, uh, the brute force approach. In your homework, you are asked to derive the magnetic field in a solenoid using Ampere's law, which should be much simpler than uh, the steps here. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, we're, we're only going to touch on the main portions of this so you understand the concept and process. So if you're trying to derive the magnetic field in a solenoid coil, actually the best thing to do is to go back a little bit earlier in our notes where we figured out the magnetic field from a circular loop. A solenoid coil, you can think about it, is just a bunch of loops like this. So we went through the process, the, the brute force integration process, of finding the magnetic field at some position z above a loop of uh, wire. And that loop had a current going through it. And we found that this was the current. Uh, some of the key features was that, was that the um, magnetic field goes through the axis of the loop. Right, so it's in this vertical direction. So if you happen to be sitting on the Z axis, the magnetic field is going to be just in the Z direction. You won't have these lateral components. Um, all right. We went through the process of figuring that out. Uh, what are the main steps of the process? We said there's DL cross R, and we had to do an integration there in order to figure out the uh, magnetic field there. Now what we're doing is we're going to build off of that. We say the inductance, I'm sorry, the magnetic field in a solenoid coil. We know what the magnetic field is from a single loop. And in order to figure out what the magnetic field is from multiple loops, all we do is we add up the contributions of each loop. So if you look at a solenoid here, you, know, you, you can think about a loosely wound solenoid where you have, you know, the the wire is going around like this. You can see the helical shape of it. And so you just have multiple loops. And each loop creates a magnetic field. And the more loops you have, uh, the, the more magnetic field is going to be created. This is an example of a tightly wound solenoid coil. Um, and the difference between the two, normally uh, solenoids are tightly wound like this. Um, loosely wound solenoids, you'll get some of these fringing um, magnetic fields. Uh, due to, um, you know, due to Ampere's law, whenever you have current going through a wire, or the Bios of Art law you can think about, whenever you have current going through a wire, you have a rotating magnetic field around it. If you tightly wound the coil, then you don't have some of these, uh, um, these rotating fields, and most of the field is concentrated inside here. So this is a more efficient solenoid. So the way that we think about this in, in terms of how do we do the calculation is that we cut a cross-section of the solenoid. So we imagine that we're just cutting a plane through the solenoid, and this is what that cross section looks like. So in the cross section, you'll see that on the left hand side, you have current going coming out of the page, and on the right hand side, you have current going into the page. So these red circles here are each the loops of your coil. Right? If you think about cutting 
uh, cutting across from left to right like this. You're, um, you'll notice that on the right sides, all of the cr cross sections of the wire on the right side, the current will go into the screen, and on the other side, they'll go out of the screen. So, um, uh, in your homework, you're, at, you're asked to figure out Ampere's law to figure, figure out the magnetic field. All right, so um, I'll just go over real quickly how we find the magnetic field using this approach, um, and then I'll just jump to the homework and talk about how you can use Ampere's law to do the same thing. So the argument here is that magnetic fields add. So this is the magnetic field from a single loop. If you want to find the magnetic field from a segment of a solenoid that has n loops in it, all you do is you add this n in here. You're multiplying by the number of loops. It's quite simple in that sense. And the total field can be found by integrating over the length z. And there's some math involved here that we are going to skip over in the interest of time. But if you take this equation here, if you take this dh equation and you integrate it along the z-axis, um, you would find that if the, if the solenoid is fairly short, then uh, your magnetic field is going to be equal to z-hat. It's in the z-direction, n times i, so the number of uh, the number of coils that you have multiplied by the current i uh, over 2 multiplied by sine of theta 2 minus sine of theta 1. Theta 2 is this angle here and theta 1 is this angle here. So if you happen to be right in the middle, these th um, uh, the theta 2 and theta 1 will be, uh, will be equal to each other. Um, if you are way out here, your theta 1 and theta 2 are going to be different. So if you have a short solenoid, this is what the field looks like. If the solenoid becomes very long, then these theta terms drop out and the, the magnetic field becomes just Ni over L. It's a very, very simple equation for the magnetic field. And this is the, when solenoids are designed, this is the, the target here. You have a long solenoid um, and we can just approximate the magnetic field as the number of turns times the current divided by the length of the solenoid. It's a very simple equation. So um, actually what I'll do then is I, I'm going to uh, show you how Ampere's law can be used to um, calculate the magnetic field in a solenoid. So this is actually going over part of the homework. Uh, let me move this over. All right, so this was homework question number um, no. one sec to make sure that I have the um, have the version with uh, with the answers on it. One second. All right, there we go. All right, so um, we are going to look at uh, problem. Not problem four. Problem eight in the homework. So we're asked to find use Ampere's law to find the magnetic field around the solenoid. All right. So um, the hint here is that the field in the solenoid is very strong and uniform, and the field outside is negligible in comparison. So whenever you have a solenoid coil like this, you can imagine that the field is very, very strong in the middle, and it's going through in this direction. 
And outside of it, yeah, there are some fields, but it's, it's uh, negligible compared to the strength of the field inside the solenoid. So whenever we apply Ampere's law, you have to create an Amperian contour. And our rules for applying the Amperian contour was that uh, the, the magnetic field should be um, uh, uh, perpendicular or in the same direction as DL, and it should be uniform everywhere on the contour. Uh, and the way that you can think about this, if you all can see my mouse here, is that if you can make your Amperian contour to follow the magnetic field lines, this is the kind of symmetry that you want to look for. All right, so the key concept here is you want to make an Amperian contour that looks like this. It goes around like this. An Amperian contour has to be a closed loop. All right, just to remind everyone that... Uh, Ampere's law here. How do we apply Ampere's law? We have to choose an Amperean contour. The current I should go through the surface enclosed by the contour, and the magnetic field should be constant or zero everywhere on the contour. Then you use Ampere's law to solve for the magnetic field. The current I should go through the surface enclosed by the contour. So. When we go to this example and we draw our cross section, what we're going to do is create an Amperian contour going through, um, you know, encircling all the current going into the page. All right, notice we're not doing this one. If we enclose both of them, then we have some current going into the page, some current going out of the page, so the total current would end up being zero. So that wouldn't really help us find the answer to this. So what we do instead is that we have we enclose our ampere we have our Amperian contour enclosing one of the set of loops where all the current is going into the page. Now when we think about the shape of the magnetic field, the magnetic field is going around like this. It's it's in the direction of my mouse. It's going around um, in in this clockwise direction. All right, so Everywhere along that contour, the magnetic field is in the same direction as, uh, as DL. So it's going in this direction. All right. So in the upper and lower segments, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the magnetic field is negligible. Okay, so we can actually just ignore those upper and lower segments. If you assume that the solenoid is long, then we mainly want to consider the magnetic field along this line and along this line. Now, um, so outside, it turns out, one of the simplifying assumptions that you can make is that the magnetic field outside the solenoid is also um, negligible. H dot DL is equal to zero outside. The reason why we said is because the magnetic field strength outside a solenoid coil is um, very small compared to the one on the inside. So we just ignore that. So three portions of our line integral, the top line, the bottom line, and the right line, three portions we don't even have to calculate. The only line integral part that we have to calculate is the portion in here. So we have to look at h dot dl in the middle here. All right, so here h is uniform. It's pointing in the z direction. And when you set up Ampere's law, it looks like this. Um, Ampere's law is uh, the, the total, the line integral of the magnetic field dotted with DL, so the direction that you're going. So you're taking a line integral going around this contour is equal to the amount of current, the total amount of current going through the surface. So the total amount of current going through the surface is um, you know, there's a current I everywhere where you see a circle here. That's one of the loops of the wire. There's a current I going through um, through that wire into the page. So the total amount of current going into the page is the number of loops times I. So that's why you see the N times I on this side. So uh, you take your H dot DL. Um, on the, the inner portion, the outer portion, the top, and the bottom. So you have your four sides of the loop here. Top, bottom, inner, and outer. 
So you're summing all of those up so that you go around the entire contour like this, and that's equal to n times i. Um, three of these lines in the line integral, the outer, the top, and bottom, are negligible compared to the line integral on the inner side. So uh, that's why you can put a zero for all three of these. And the line integral in the inner side, h dot dl, this is your unknown that you're going to solve for, solve for. So you say that there's a magnetic field in the z direction multiplied by the length. When you integrate this magnetic field along dl, you're going to get hz times the length. All right, because the magnetic field is uniform. Oops. Well, that's strange. Where did that go? The magnetic field is uniform everywhere along the surface. So you get Hz times L, and you solve for H in the Z direction, you get Ni over L here. So what you had to know is that you had to know by the symmetry is that there's a strong uniform magnetic field on the inside. The magnetic field on the outside, the other three lines, were essentially zero. They're negligible. All right. All right. Uh, questions? Um, oh, I see Abdullah's comment from before. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get to that. When you were talking about particles accelerator, were you talking about, oh, uh, applications to applications of electromagnets. Yes, particles accelerators are one way you can use uh, electromagnets to, uh, for science. For the maglev, yes, that's, that is also true. Right, uh, particle accelerators use very strong magnetic fields. Maglevs also require very strong magnetic fields. Uh, any questions about applying Ampere's law to this problem? Okay, good. Then we will go on. All right, now that we've found the magnetic field in a solenoid coil, uh, we can talk about this concept of inductance. So here we're just defining the inductance, uh, what this is, and then we're calculating it for a solenoid, because a solenoid is the most common type of inductor. Uh, so we know what magnetic flux is. It's the total flux going through a surface. So you think about a solenoid coil like this. There is magnetic field going through the surface like this everywhere. Uh, the sum of all v vectors. So these are all of our magnetic field vectors. So the sum of all those vectors is equal to the flux. Okay. And so uh, the flux is denoted by this. The flux is equal to the integral of b dot ds. So you're adding up all of the b vectors along the surface s. Right? So the physical meaning of magnetic flux is it's the total magnetic uh, total amount of magnetic field vectors that goes through a specific surface. Uh, for a solenoid, the magnetic flux is um, it turns out that if you do this if you do this integral b dot ds, it, it turns out to be equal to the number of um, you know, dependent on the number of turns you have. So let's see where that comes from. In the previous slide, we found that uh, B, so H is equal to Ni over L in the Z hat direction. So B is just going to be equal to, which is equal to mu H. So B and H are related by this constant mu. And this is equal to Ni over L times mu. So that's the magnetic field inside uh, inside the solenoid coil. Okay. And uh, you find the total magnetic field through the entire surface. So you integrate this along the z direction. 
and you find that uh, the, the magnetic flux is equal to n divided by L times I times A. So this is the area of each loop. So this is the, the total magnetic flux that's in a solenoid coil, so multiple loops of coil. And then there's a third concept of magnetic flux linkage, linkage, and this is the magnetic field that links the loops of the, the, uh, uh, the solenoid together. So the concept of flux linkage means, it refers to this idea is that you have, um, you know, let's say you have one loop here. So this loop is generating some kind of magnetic field like this. This loop here is generating some magnetic field like this. And some of this flux is actually, some of the uh, magnetic field is going through the adjacent coil. So each coil is generating its own magnetic field, but some of that magnetic field is going into the other coils. So, you know, without getting into all the details of it, uh, the, the way that they refer to that, that's what's referred to as this flux linkage. It's a magnetic field that links all the loops of the structure. And um, uh, flux linkage, linkage is defined as N times the magnet, uh, magnetic flux. And so it's just, uh, so that, that's how you get this N squared here, right? This has N to the power of one, you multiply that by N, you get an N squared here. And then the last concept here is the self-inductance is, is defined as the magnetic flux linkage divided by the current. And so you take this and you divide by I and you get the inductance. So mu N squared divided by L times A. So just like capacitance is epsilon A over D for capacitors, it's a simple definition of the simplest type of capacitor, a parallel plate capacitor. This is the analogy in the magnetic domain. The inductance of the simplest type of um, inductor, which is a solenoid coil, a, a coil of wire, is, is basically this. The number of turns squared times the magnetic permeability of the core divided by the length of the solenoid multiplied by the area of the solenoid. All right, so um, I just want to make sure that we got to this concept here. This is a formula describing the inductance of a basic solenoid coil. Um, let's see, I think it, I will just uh, go through this slide very quickly. Uh, like I said, I don't expect you to know it for the exam. Um, I just want to mention that the magnetic energy, just like you can store energy in a capacitor, you can also store energy in an inductor. And the way that you would derive the magnetic energy um, is you can uh, use this relationship P equals IV and the definition of the inductance, V equals L di dt. You may have remembered this from your circuits classes. And um, you can perform an integration to find the total energy stored in an, in an inductor. Without going into all the details of this, you find that the magnetic energy is 1 half Li squared. Okay, if anyone is interested in this, um, the details of this, feel free to contact me. We can go over it during any time of office hours this week. And um, the, the magnetic energy can also be expressed as a formula dependent on the volume of the inductor and the magnetic field H. And the reason why the volume is important is in circuits, we're always trying to build the most, we're trying to build uh, components that are small and tiny so that they can fit on small printed circuit boards. So that's why we try to put the induct inductance in terms of the volume. Um, and it turns out that the, the energy stored in an inductor is one half mu h squared, magnetic field squared, multiplied by V. So the larger your inductor is, the more energy it can store. And it's a linear relationship. It's a square relationship to the magnetic field. So the more, you know, if you are trying to store a lot of energy in an inductor, you'd be better off trying to increase your magnetic field rather than trying to increase your volume. Right, so this uh, one half CV squared, this is your analogy in the magnetic domain, one half Li squared. The last concept here is just the, um, the concept of magnetic materials. I just wanna touch a little bit on, um, you know, where magnetism arises. Why are some materials magnetic and other ones aren't? So if we look at the atomic level, it's a very basic um, but intuitive understanding in the textbook. Um, all materials have or orbital mo magnetic moments. Some of them have electron spin moments. 
So the way that we think about this is that uh, all atoms, all materials, have a, a nucleus. The atom has a nucleus, and then there's electrons that orbit around the nucleus. You can think about them in terms of just these basic planetary type orbits. That's the Bohr model. You can also think about them in terms of these more complex orbits um, described by the quantum mechanical model. But in either case, the electron orbits around, is moving around the nucleus. As it, as it moves around the nucleus, um, you can think about the bios of art law. The bios of art law, you know, you think about your right hand rule. Whenever you have moving current, whenever you have moving charge, it generates a magnetic field around it, right? So in this direction, um, in this case, like you have electrons going around in this direction. So you're going to have, um, if you do your right hand rule, your thumb is pointing opposite the electron, because remember, electron is a negative charge. So your um, thumb is moving in the opposite direction. It's going to generate a magnetic field in, in this, um, actually, I don't think I, I think I got the direction wrong. The, with the right hand rule, it should actually go in this direction. Your thumb is pointing opposite the movement of the electron. And so you end up getting a magnetic field like this. And just like a loop of wire, you have electron going around in an orbit like this, you end up getting a magnetic field uh, pointing in the downward direction, in the middle. So this is very similar to a loop of uh, a, a, a coil, one loop of a coil. So this gives you a magnetic moment, just the fact that you have electrons orbiting the nucleus. The second thing is the electrons actually have their own spin. And this is a quantum mechanical concept that we don't get into the details of, we just give a very hand wavy type argument here, is that electrons, you can think about them as spinning in one, one direction or spinning in the other direction. And as, as a result of the spinning, you get a, uh, a magnetic moment. Now, what, if some of you remember when you when you fill in the electrons in all the energy levels and, and energy states available, um, some of the electrons have positive spin and some of them have negative spin. If you have an even number of electrons, you have some with uh, um, uh, some with a plus spin and some with minus spin, and then they cancel out. If you have an odd number of electrons, then then you have some net. Uh, magnetization from the the fact that you have some spinning electrons. Okay, so um, atoms that have an odd number of electrons tend to have more magnetization. Um, the discussion can get much more complicated because there's some atomic structure, other atomic structure effects that we're not talking about here. But basically, uh, materials can be divided into diamagnetic, um, paramagnetic, and then ferromagnetic. Uh, diamagnetic materials, it's the magnetization mechanism is primarily due to this orbital magnet moment. Paramagnetic materials mainly dependent on the electron spin. And then ferromagnetism relies on these things called magnetized domains, uh, which again, we're just going to have a very, very high level introduction to. But ferromagnetic materials have by far the strongest uh, uh, magnetization. Uh, magnetization is described by the magnetic susceptibility, and then um, the magnetic permeability. Diamagnetic and paramagnetic materials both have a mu r of 1, which means they're very similar to air. They're not very magnetic. Uh, they don't really support magnetic fields that well. But if you have a ferromagnetic material, this can be much larger than 1. So purified iron, for example, has uh, a magnetic permeability of 10 to the 5th compared to diamagnetic and paramagnetic, which is around the order of 1. So it's a huge difference. The ferromagnetic materials have massive amounts of magnetic fields, and that's why they're used in types of applications where you need to have a, a high permeability, like the electromagnets that I mentioned. Iron, nickel, and cobalt are uh, common uh, ferromagnetic materials. Um, so the relationship between uh, the magnetic field and magnetic permeability and susceptibility this is all very similar to the electrostatics chapter when we talked about um, dielectric susceptibility and the dielectric constant. The relations are almost exactly the same with the way that they're set up. Okay, you have uh, B. Uh, B is related to H by this relationship here. H plus a magnetization. This is material dependent. This magnetization vector is equal to the susceptibility times H. 
So this susceptibility is a material parameter. And this equation then simplifies into mu0 times mu r times h. Mu r is the magnetic permeability. And this equal to, it's equal to 1 plus the susceptibility. This mu r is the material of parameter that we care about. So for magnetic materials, mu r is going to be much larger than 1. For non-magnetic materials, mu r is going to be equal to 1. And so this relationship is stating that the magnetic field B and uh, the, magnet, uh, the H are related. So I'm sorry, let me define magnetic flux density is B, and then the magnetic field intensity is H. So they're saying B and H are related through just this a linear constant that's material dependent, mu0 and mu r. So that is implying a linear relationship between B and H. All right. Um, in reality, some of these ferromagnetic materials, um, there is actually a nonlinear relationship between B and H. So we can approximate ferromagnetic materials as having a mu O and mu R, um, but it's not always just a simple linear relationship. There's this thing called a hysteresis, and this hysteresis is the basis of um, magnetic materials, uh, permanent magnets, I should say. So the basic concept behind, behind magnetic field hysteresis is, is that you have unmagnetized domains in a ferromagnetic material. So think about all these magnets, tiny, teeny, tiny magnets, um, but they're all pointing in different directions. So there's no net magnetic field, because when these magnetic fields sum up, they sum to zero. If you, you align all these, magne, uh, all these domains with an external magnet, so let's say you put... Um, you know, you put an external magnet here like this to align all the domains. You, once they're aligned like this, the atoms actually rearrange. And as a result, um, you know, once it's aligned like this, it actually stays like this. Unless you uh, put a different magnetic field on it in the opposite direction, you cause these things to rotate again in a different direction. So what that means is that there's, um, that you can pr create a permanent magnet by just taking a ferromagnetic material and aligning all the magnetic domains with an external magnet. And that process is called pulling. Um, there are, um, uh, there's a concept called residual flux density and that, that says basically how strong is a magnet after it has been magnetized. Hard ferromagnetic materials uh, require strong magnetic fields to, uh, to magnetize it, but they also have uh, residual flux densities, mean, meaning like once they're magnetized, they are more difficult to demagnetize, and they tend to be stronger as well. The soft ferromagnetic materials are easily magnetized and demagnetized. They, they don't have as strong a uh, residual flux density, so they tend to be weaker permanent magnets. So this looks, this is how you were to, were to, um, uh, pull a magnet or align the magnetic domains. Uh, initially, the, the magnet has all randomized domains, so um, B is equal to zero. You take your external magnet and you increase H, and so you, as you increase H, uh, you're going go to um, th you're gonna go up this curve here, and the magnetic domains are going to start to align, and so you'll, you'll have a large H and a large B within the material. Now you decide, okay, I'm done pulling it. I'm going to take the H, the external magnetic field off. I'll take H off. As you take it off, you take H down to zero. You realize that, oh, even after I took the magnetic field off, there's still residual flux density here. And this is how we, how we use permanent magnets. You pull the magnet. After you pull the magnet, there's still some magnetized domains, even after you remove the external magnetic field. And so this generates its own magnetic field now, and that is the residual flux density. If you want to um, change the direction of these domains, you have to go in the opposite direction and go all the way down to A4. Then you'll, you know, you'll, have, you'll have a magnet. Now when you remove your external field, you're going to end up here, where you have a residual flux density in the opposite direction. All right. So this is the basis of some of the permanent magnets. All right, to summarize here, so magnetic fields, um, they are analogous to electrostatic fields. We found that the Lorentz force, the first thing that we looked at here, the Lorentz force on the left 
is uh, used in many applications like Hall effect sensors, electric motors. Uh, we talked about how we calculate current induced magnetic fields using the Bios of Art law, Gauss's law, and Ampere's law. We looked at wires, sheets, and loops, and then eventually we got into looking at toroidal coils and solenoids, which had applications in electromagnets. We talked a little bit about inductance as a way of describing the ability of a structure to store energy in the form of a magnetic field. And we spent time looking at the solenoid, which is the most common type of inductor, the most common type of electromagnet. It's used in door locks, inductive power transfer, RF communications, uh, electric motors, and so on. And then finally, we just talked very, very briefly about magnetic materials, magnetic permeability, and uh, magnetizable domains. So that's the, the summary of this module. As I said, you are not expected to uh, know any of the material that we covered today. If anything, it would be something like, like a super basic question, like what is the permeability or something like that. So and nothing, nothing involved because this is the last uh, lecture and I, I, I would like for you to focus your efforts on the previous homework, um, the last three homeworks, which is going to comprise most of the final exam. All right. So um, any questions on... Um, the last portion of the magnetic magnetostatics. Questions from anyone? Okay. All right, good then. I'm going to stop the recording here.